people here that were part of our group at, at six, so we thought we'd give people a few more minutes to, to get here on a sunny day. And so thank you all for coming. Uh, we're glad that we have more faces here. And that's pretty exciting. Um, it is a beautiful sunny day out there, so hard to be here inside. So this is the second community meeting for the Maple Leaf Family Chorus. And I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Kim Baldwin. I'm a project manager with the Seattle Parks Department. And I'd also like to introduce the design team, the Bourbon Partnership by Landscape Architects, Ed Ray Miller and Katie Bang. And then in the back, um, we have Shannon and Andy who are, who are helping out this evening. So if you have housekeeping items, um, we do have a sign-in sheet. So if you take the time to sign in, that would be great. It counts for the communities um, towards their match for the, the DOMN grant. And it also helps us to build our email list for sending out um, mass emails about projects that are happening in your area. So if you'd like to be on that list, that would be great to add your email address. If you don't want to be on that list, please just sign your name in so they can use your, your time as part of the match. Um, and then there are also um, other bits of information. I think the public involvement summary, which contains some information about the projects so you can take that home with you and read it in leisure. And there are also a couple of other flyers I see out there that some people brought in. So please um, take a look at the table by the door before you leave this evening. Um, so I would like to start out by going over the agenda. All right, so the main goals um, to present design concepts based on earlier input that we, we received, to listen to and hear feedback from you, the neighborhood the community as we move towards the final schematic design. So we'll spend the first half hour this evening giving an update on the Greater Reservoir Project. Um, I have some information from this view. Greg is going to review the concept design for the upper reservoir area. Jason Hopp from Arts is here to talk about the artist's progress. And then we'll take a few minutes for questions. Then after that, we'll move into part two of the meeting, which is focused on the play area, presentation and design. Um, I have a little bit to say, and then we'll move we'll right into the presentation of concepts and breaking out into small groups. If, we're, if we don't have a lot of people, we might keep it as one group, but we can talk about that um, at, at 6 30 and see how many folks are here and people want to break into small groups. <coughs> as one. <coughs> so, this is a nice backdrop for the design for the full reservoir. Um, so I'm going to start with an update from Stephanie Murphy, and she's a project manager for, for the reservoir burial project. Um, so let's see. Um, so the park in general has $5 million for the parks and green spaces levy. Um, and um, sorry, I kind of got off track there. Um, so anyhow, the reservoir structure is scheduled to be um, complete in September of 2011, and and that's like the, the literal like concrete cell structure itself. And then in October of this year, they're going to start backfilling, and that will take a couple of months. And they'll move forward with progress on, on completing the kind of the earthwork and everything that you see from the outside. But then in the fall, or early next year, um, it's quite a long time period, they're going to be doing testing on the reservoir, and they're going to be testing um, different systems, the electrical, mechanical, instrumentation, and control, um, a lot of a lot of interesting elements, and then finally, the acceptance of the overall system performance. So it's, it's pretty involved in talking here. It's not, it's not really interesting if there are any engineers out here who know about these kinds of things. And then the res reservoir is targeted to be put into commission early next year. And so our project is contingent upon their completion. Um, when, you know, when we can start, when they leave, and we can get in there and start our project. Um, if you have any further questions, I have a phone number and contact information for Stephanie. So please, please see me after. Donna's going to have a question. I was just curious about the rain guard. Did she mention that at all? No, I didn't okay. have any specifics about the rain garden. I can call her. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. And then I also have information from Nancy Palmer of SPU about the chlorination building. And the chlorination building is located right down here. And it's, it's small. I don't know if you have a you know, play ball, you might not even know it's there, but it's, it's down in this area. And Seattle Public Utilities is planning to demolish this building. And um, this is going to happen towards the second quarter.
quarter of 2012, and they're going to do that because it's no longer needed. Um, they're moving from chlorination to hypochlorite treatment and with a new reservoir, so they don't have a need to maintain that building. And just some basic information about the project. Um, so, as I said earlier, it's, you know, it's funded by the Parks and Green Space Levy, so thank you, Seattle. Um, $5 million for our total project budget. And we had four meetings for, for the, to, to get to this schematic design, starting in 2009 and ending last year in July. And at that time, we told you we were going to table this project. And we've pretty much done that, except for a few coordination issues coordination issues with SPU on elements like um, irrigation, electrical, getting power in there, getting water, um, some of the alignments of their roles and some of their features to remain. So it's really been minimal coordination. Uh, but now we're at the point where we're, we're moving forward again. Um, we did meet with friends of athletic fields um, for the request to, to, hear, uh, to hear some of their priorities and concerns. The funding is available to make the, the reservoir of the middle hole, the new area hole, and that really create a functioning, beautiful park up there. But if there is funding available, then they'll make some improvements on the water fields. And so now we know what the priorities are, so we can, we can work with them in that way. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, we're moving forward with the design of the play area. We're kind of getting up to that at the same level as, as everything else so that we can move the project forward as a whole. So we, we're, um, we know there, there was a time when we, this was funded separately and the funding was becoming available later, but we're going to move the funding forward so we can get this entire site as one project, which will be beneficial in many ways. So as soon as we have a schematic design for the play area and the terrace, then we'll move into construction documents and everything for the entire site. And so that's that's exciting. We're on that path right now. And with that, I would like to introduce Greg Broward here. Come on up. Um, one quick question. I forgot to answer this question, but it's going to be bid as one project, the entire thing? Yes. Uh, field that would be uh, natural grass. 
But we all looked at it and said, we kind of want to think about a way that uh, we can incorporate some of what we heard from the community. And kind of hearing about the, the wind, water, and wings uh, theme, um, playing off of that idea, we, we kind of had this idea to go with some earth waves, some earth burns. Um, interesting enough that this is one idea that when we met with SPU, that they actually were possibly interested in us doing or allowing us to do because what we said is we can actually create some landforms by putting foam on the reservoir. We're not adding any additional weight and then just take the profile of soil and move it up on top of the foam and, and create so that. Some of this could be done with plant materials, so the height of plant materials, that type of thing. But just kind of give this interesting edge, uh, kind of trying to pick up on the theme, uh, this idea that it's <coughs> open water and it's going to be a, a good you know, reservoir, very reservoir which is something to kind of pick up some character that was um, uh, important to the community and to the neighborhood. So something that kind of personalized it is. Um, down in this, this corner, we've, we've identified, um, with the help of the community views, uh, very important uh, from this, this uh, park. There's a, a location way back here that has pretty strong views in both directions. Uh, there's another kind of local view from this area on this corner. But this is one of the stronger views where you actually see the city, the water, uh, the mountains. And so we started to set this up as a um, kind of a gathering space, viewpoints, um, places for people to uh, be able to, to sit and look at the views and enjoy that. So kind of a kind of an informal gathering space over here that we hope will we'll take some of the burden of this this ridge, which we understand is where everybody goes to watch the fireworks and other things. So, once a year basis. So. Um, the, the slope in between, so we have the existing slope with the vegetation. There's an existing stair uh, which is slated to come out. It's still there today, so it might be one of my questions for Stephanie is that stair really going to come out? But um, we've got another access point uh, identified in here. The intention being that, that you can enter the park here, be able to move all the way through and exit the park out to the north. Um, likewise, I point out that you can enter the park on the east, move through, and then exit to the west. So we're trying to create some true routes, uh, circulation through the park. Um, so most of the terraces are the hillside will stay um, with the existing vegetation. Uh, it is a, it's an environmentally critical area, so we have to be careful of what we do uh, in that area. We might uh, be able to limit some trees and get a little bit more views, but we, we have to be pretty cautious of uh, what we do. Uh, so down on the sports terrace, um, looks probably pretty familiar. As, that was intentional, is that we're trying to use uh, as much of the space as, as it exists today because we don't have a lot of budget allocated. But we want to think about resurfacing these, maybe getting ir new irrigation in this area, uh, maybe expanding the playability of this field uh, because it does slow back pretty quickly in here. So it's a pretty modest uh, enhancement. Maybe a little bit of a plaza space for people to wait and gather between games. Uh, waiting for their game to start after the game is finished. Um, overlay for some modified size soccer fields uh, down here also is an open opportunity. Um, and then uh, lastly, <coughs> in the terrace, we'll talk more about that, but uh, the uh, restroom, the existing restroom in the park is right here. Um, we've got a slope on this side, which defines one edge of it with some pretty good sized trees and a hedge, um, which is a pretty unique feature that not many of Seattle parks have hedges that are, are kept in, uh, in that is this one is. Um, then the play area, so this idea of having a couple of different kinds of opportunities for play. Um, uh, we kind of a natural play, a build play, and, uh, and, a, and a children's garden were some of the themes that we uh, worked with and had people give us some for the last time we got together. And I think that kind of brings us full circle. So, you know. um, so just a couple of quick things first. Are there any any more questions regarding the pull of the reservoir project? From the top end of the design, there's a lot of trees. Can you tell us anything about those trees? Uh, where, where we had left it with the schematic plan was that those are all probably smaller scale trees. Why? Um, <laughs> what we, why? 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 Um, well, because we're we're respecting the views of the people that live along that north edge, the openness. You'll notice that they were, even though from the park they were in a band like this, they were also arranged sort of radially so you could see through them. So from in the park you'll be able to see the this kind of grove of trees at the north side, but 
um, respecting the views that these neighbors have always had of the park and through um, beyond the park and, and to the city and the mountain beyond. Um, so we just thought a, a smaller scale a tree would be appropriate uh, for that type of application. They might be um, columnar too, they might be more vertical as an option, but definitely not uh, big heavy shade trees. We're just, yeah, we're focusing on the kids' area now, and then we'll get going on the design development here in another you know, about a month or so and start to identify species and varieties. Mm -hmm. A couple weeks ago, the um, uh, construction folks tore out a swath like 50 feet wide of the trees right in the middle. What's at the top of that, that big gray square that's at the base of the lid? Yeah, they did. They took down a swath from their technical background, but there are a lot of pipes and um, utilities that are running through there, so it's kind of, that area is just riddled with their, their required systems. But what's, systems. what's the square up there? Is that a building, or is that just like a no, concrete platform? There's three access points that SPU will, will have. This is one, and there's two smaller ones up here. Um, You'll probably see, we've been working on Jefferson Park down at Beacon Hill, and you'll probably have, well right now it'll be a, probably a 10 foot chain link fence with barbed wire on the top, and then you'll see some flat structures inside there. Um, most of the space is for them to be able to get trucks in there and maneuver and that type of thing, so there's not a lot of other things in there, but it will be a fenced off space. It's, it's partly why we try to mask these as best we can. They, they don't want us planting anything tall or vertical near them, but we try to put up into some of these sweeping forms so that we can mitigate the presence a little bit. So, so this thing is main access is going to be through here, and they need 24-7 access to those wells. So that's something we're very, very conscious of. Any other last questions? Yes? Is the area around the water tower that going to be changed off? Is there, is there some like, contamination issues? But there are contamination issues there, and we're not touching on with this project. There, so so the, the area around will probably be more. Well, the, the fence, we've actually got the drill with the black line on that shows the fence oh, that will be there. The, what you see when we sweep that form in again was, was an idea that they've been warm to. We haven't gotten approval to do it, but this idea that we could actually just ignore the fence and sweep some of our, our landscape, maybe it's grasses, maybe it's a kind of ground cover show, but just try to soften that transition.
within all of these uh, horizontal areas that are going to be exposed in slicing and overlapping, um, pastures going to do some very shallow pools in there so that during the rainy season, uh, water will collect in this area to kind of fit into a reflective pool. Uh, sort of, again, it's like in the sky, the mountains. So you have this really you have this connection between, especially from where the, the views from the site flow, you can see the water sources. How large are those uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. You're pretty good. Uh, about five feet. Okay. Um, so actually, here's one stone we selected, or he selected a few months back at the Cedar Watershed. So it's 78 inches. It'll be sliced a bit. And then also the footing. So it'll probably be about five feet in height. And about six feet in width. Where the two stones come together. And Stone from the tools. So SPU has been really involved with the project and kind of helping Patrick out identifying the stones. And, and the nice thing about this, I, I don't know how much access it will be, but he's going to actually do a lot of the work with, with, the, with a lot of the work uh, with the carving with, with those shell tools on site. So he'll be there. He'll, he'll spend a lot of time here with the community to uh, work on the project. <laughs> Yeah, they'll all have a coating that's just to help protect their sacrificial coating and not be applied. What? Recall them to remove them. Two questions. Can we have access to your pictures? Like on the website or? Are they on your own website? Um, actually, they can use possibly our information for the name of the Yeah, we can work with ours to make sure that they're taking it. Oh, yeah. Um, the other question is, is if you put a protective coating on it, Will that like not let moss or whatever? Because some of those rocks have moss on them, like like stuff like that grow on us. I don't know. I mean, they're going to be flame trees. They're going to be wiped off. Uh -huh. uh, they're going to grow, 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 eliminate. But I mean, over time, I don't know. Yeah. In those areas, moss That's probably good. moss probably won't grow on it because that gets a lot of sunshine there, and moss tends to like the shade. So I would guess it will grow on the north. We're just thinking about yeah. Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 about the areas that collect the water, the pools, uh, breeding mosquitoes. Yeah, we're, we're going to continue to be very shallow, so that they'll, they'll evaporate uh, when the sun does come out. So yeah, they're not going to be you know, deep, deep pools, so just very, very shallow. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. And is this going to be presented like a traditional sculpture with a that thing around it sort of thing? Or? That's, uh, you know, he and Berger are working on how the setting where the sculpture will be. They're, they're working on that, so uh, hopefully they can. The idea is to integrate it within the project. It was pretty solid in sketches, but you could kind of see the, the circle and then kind of that, that new shed that we, that, there you just barely kind of see how we just started that dialogue about how these will fit together. So when we get looking at that corner a little bit more and think about the grades and how that will sit in there, we're, we're going to be kind of, and we thought it was a great idea when we started to talk about this because we sort of felt like we needed a focal point out on that on that corner, something to really enhance that. So we're glad that he was excited about using that too. And only that it's aware, you know, people have sort of macro and micro interaction with these. Neighborhood. 
looks large matching there and received it. So yay, that's exciting. Um, so that's <laughs>
seasonal change, things that change all the time, so there's always something that's interesting. Um, playing with textures, things that are in children's scale, so using like plants, like dinosaur food, for example, that has big leaves and things that can kind of bring you down to their, their level. Uh, incorporating like uh, birds and butterflies and, and bugs somehow within the children's garden, using some sort of rain garden or rainwater harvesting within the children's garden, um, a compost area, and then education through interaction with the landscape, not just having signage, but actually like educating children by having them engage into the area. Um, things that have a short time span, because we all know kids do. <laughs> so things that you can see change very quickly, such as sunflowers, you can plant them and they get really big really quickly. Um, plants that smell and mazes and incorporating art within the area. And as Kim had mentioned, um, the family chair subcommittee, these are a couple of the schematic ideas that, have, um, that we've been working with them on so far. And so this is an idea of having um, a bike trail and having a quote going through the bike trail and the bike sculpture. And then um, incorporating again that the idea of discovery and, and butterflies and um, using butterflies throughout the park. And those could be like a, a game of can you find 13 butterflies that were in the park? And so this is just some very conceptual ideas of what those might be. Um, again, it's, it's in the very early stages. So this is just some ideas of um, like a bronze sculpture of this one's of a bee or a stained glass butterfly that's something that's more colorful. And this here is just, um, this is really neat. This is an artist that put together, um, these are actual wings of a butterfly that happen to make letters. So they could be some way of incorporating that. So these will be on the boards too. I just thought this might be an easier way for you guys to take a look at some of these. And we'll be looking for input on this. And, the idea is really just to give us an idea of conceptually if we're on the mark or are we not. So that's why we're here today to talk about it. Um, these are just some examples of some pieces of play equipment that I've um, gone around and asked some local man manufacturers, parks that are uh, locally around the city. Um, so what I thought we heard, and again, confirm, <laughs> is that we want natural uh, play equipment or natural materials, so wood, um, stainless steel slides, those kind of things. So these are just some ideas to give you um, just the essence of what we're talking about, really. And so don't take these literally. Like, if you see a piece and you say, I like that, but I don't want three slides on it, I want this, tell us that. That's what we're here for today. So these are some examples of natural wood materials. Um, again, Treehouse was mentioned and, and really wanted, but we did take a look at that. We have been kind of looking at the budget and what we can really um, incorporate into this park. And unfortunately, we don't really have the money to have a separate structure, but we could have something, a treehouse play structure, something like that. So this is an example of that. Um, so here's some more natural elements. Um, these are pre-manufactured pieces. The log balancing beam, the log tunnels, the little mushroom steppers. Um, Maybe that's not what we heard. Maybe we want something that's a little more uh, nets and, and a little more colorful and just a little, not as natural and a little more modern, I guess. It's still natural, it just has spiders. It happens to be spiders. And this <laughs> is kind of a compromise between the two. It's using the spiders and the kind of more modern play equipment, but with a, new, a more neutral, natural tone. I heard through the play, through all the meetings, Green and red, green and purple, green and, so I'm like, okay, well, let's do green, and then we'll figure out what the other things are. Um, green, here's another example. So platforms, again, and different ways to come off of things. And as Greg had mentioned, we'd like to go with a, um, a real stone tunnel or something like that, but these are some some examples of a, or a manufactured um, piece of equipment that we could do some caves and things like that and balancing these. Um, this is a, just a, a real picture of what that treehouse structure might look like. So what we have is, is two options to show you tonight. And what we've done is we're, there's going to be a lot of similarities between them because you saw on the master plan, the schematic plan, we sort of arranged the parts and we felt there was a comfort to how the pieces were coming together. And so now it's kind of developing those ideas a little bit, uh, what, what are the actual components. We'll run through those now, and then we'll kind of get, the, get them up side by side so you can look at them. We're going to kind of do a compare and contrast. 
we want you to make some decisions to help us out with some of these bigger pieces. So um, just to get oriented, uh, we've shifted a little bit on you. North is now that direction. So Sorry. this is Roosevelt. <laughs> and right here. And that slope that we talked about with the trees on it that sweeps around this direction. Um, the existing uh, pergola is right here, and there's a little woods there that cuts through the edge. Oh, and there's the head. So don't forget to mention that. Um, and then also on this side, we have the existing um, artwork on the poles along that, the 10 foot fence along that edge. So it's kind of an interesting space. We wanted to try to do was think about uh, uh, taking advantage of some of the grade, the contour. What could we do to, to express some of that? Um, what can we do to create uh, opportunities for, for kids to, to create their own play? Again, that was the whole idea about the, the uh, adventure play. Um, and, and just try to try to wrap all these things together. Um, the, uh, the, the play area itself kind of sits in this area um, existing. So we're kind of covering that same footprint. And along this edge, we have a slope that uh, slowly gets to be all so let's say eight or nine feet, maybe eight feet in that corner um, that takes you from this, this entrance point, this existing pathway, down to the play surface itself. So we've got a nice slope in here, but we also have some trees that we want to respect. So we didn't want to just go in and take all the trees out and start over. So the majority of what you see in these large green circles are, are all existing trees. So, um, the, the idea, um, you enter into the space where you can come in off Roosevelt or you come in off of the path, but you see our, our big loop path. So there will be one thing to look at the contrast of, of the two schemes. This one has a loop path that actually takes you around the big lawn space, um, connects the children's gardens with both the uh, build play and kind of the adventure play area. Um, the idea being you've got that trike path, the ride on toys, uh, let the kids loose on that. Um, the parents, while you're waiting, uh, we've created a little bit of a plaza space here. Again, kind of that central location in the restroom, so you can keep your eye on all the activity but still be, uh, be part of it. And then there's other places to sit throughout, too, other bench locations, um, and, and a lot of natural stone has been incorporated. Um, with some of the natural materials, one of the things that we really heard was, uh, I guess what people were describing, were describing their experiences um, maybe not just locally, but even from around the world kind of experiences. But we thought it'd be interesting to kind of start drawing on our, our own location uh, for some of the inspiration. And so the stone, the idea that maybe some of the stone, just like the artist has done, he's taken the stones from the Tolk River and the Cedar River watershed. But we're thinking stones that could come from um, the Cascades, the, the Columbia. The, so we have all this kind of interesting, some of these might be glacial stones, some of them might be granite boulders, they might be mossy covered, um, we might have basalt. So this idea of collecting stones from around the state and starting to intersperse in this and, and creating places for climbing, sitting, hiding, uh, be able to play with some of those things. Um, the, the idea of a, a slide or something that takes advantage of the grade, so kind of tucked in that corner, we, we have a stone stair which allow kids to get up there and have this modest slide down. So only, we're only able to get about maybe five or six feet there, but, but still interesting to be able to have that play. Um, other places to be able to create little spots where kids can get up on the hillside. I mean, that, that hillside is actually a pretty great start. Um, some of this, the shrubs, you've noticed, and the, the kids are able to get in there and under them and things like that. So we want to just really leave as much as we can to enhance it and create some other opportunities. And so this idea about maybe using some of the stone and, and logs to create some places where the kids can actually be up on the hillside. Um, the, the path itself, the idea that you have kind of a primary path that comes through, but there's these little secondary branches on it. Um, we're always interested in kind of playing with that surface and that texture. Um, Maybe it's uh, the way we score it, the concrete, or maybe it's we put pebbles or other kinds of things interesting so the kids can ride over it, it makes a different sound. Um, and, and even the fact that uh, the subtle detail, if you see how we space the joints different, as the tires go across, the further apart, that 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 we've all heard on the highway, the freeway. Um, we're not going to play music like we did in that one commercial, but that's the idea. <laughs> that, that we get something going on with the past, so enhancing some of these. We have these, these little um, uh, places in our, our sort of braided path, uh, sand, 
as a possibility. It uh, could be a, a water collection area. Again, if you, if you think about water just like the artist, these are low areas you might collect a little bit. You splash in it, sun comes out. When it does, it dries it up, and, and uh, we don't have any sea anymore. But that opportunity for something like that. Um, then kind of moving into the, the, uh, the built play area. So we're looking at uh, a younger kids play area. So we've got a kind of a two to five year old structure um, age group in there. Um, structure for a little bit larger kid, a little, a little older kids, not larger kids, but older kids, uh, five to 12 year old um, in this area. Swings, it seems like people were really interested in the swings and you've got probably the best collection of swings because you've got the four bay with the, the 10 foot crossbar for the older kids and you've got a four bay with a eight foot crossbar for the little kids. And so we just thought in this concept we would do that and we would show both sets of swings. So you've got lots of swings out in here and we want to try to uh, duplicate. We love that high crossbar because those are the ones you actually get to, get to have a little bit more fun on. So, um, kind of tying our closet together and kind of creating this transition between the build play and the lawn, uh, this whole idea of like this, this, this graded path, again, this idea of looking at aerial photographs of the state finding these graded rivers, but these are our graded paths that kind of move through here, and the idea of being able to kind of circulate through the trees, again, giving the kids different places to play. Um, some of these might be, again, might be a sand area. Um, we've actually gone as far to think about some, some small earthen forms, kind of Thinking about the Mima Mounds is, is kind of our inspiration there. We just having some low uh, grassy shapes in there for the, for the kids to use and just kind of create their own, their own play and their own ideas. Um, so again, that's our transition from the build play to the, to the lawn, of course, the large open lawn space. And then kind of focusing up in the corner uh, at the uh, children's garden. So again, this idea of all these great paths and things, we just thought, what if we were to, to create some flow through the paths um, the, the structure, the arbor itself is, is basically uh, in its, it's, a, it's not basically, but it is actually in its existing location. We probably reset the pavers um, around it. They're kind of shifted a little bit, so we do a little bit of work there. But the idea is we create uh, some of those ideas that Katie presented about um, the sunflowers, the bee poles, um, some of those things so we have the garden that gets planted in an area like this. And then we have the real hands-on uh, space on this side, where the kids get to get dirty, and it might be um, gravel bins, sand bins, worm bins. So this idea that we have these, uh, these opportunities for the kids to really kind of get into the garden and build it themselves. So um, unique, unique opportunities there. Um, a couple of the things that, that Katie showed with the the, um, the committee that's kind of been working with the community council and us, us a little bit. Um, the idea that uh, on our bike loop or our our little super highway around. Um, this could be a location for the, the spike sculpture. It could be over in the children's garden area. And then the idea of the quote um, either being within the path or maybe even being uh, a special brand that is, is identified in, the, uh, in kind of this gathering space in this closet area. So, um, restroom largely left alone. Um, you'll see a little bit of a contrast in the, in the next week. But I think that's kind of a summary of option one. We, we tried to get about 70 or 60 or 70 feet out of it. And by the time you put all the safety things in, it got to be about 30 or 40 feet. So we're, we're pushing for 100 on this one. So by the time we lose some of that, we might still be 90 or 80 or something like that. So the idea that we get a significant zip line um, on this edge would be uh, a preference. Again, we're using that grade. The idea that you can walk in on the, the park um, space in here to the restroom area. At grade, then this is slightly goes, goes gently uphill uh, to a terrace up here, and so this is where we launch from. And up in this location also is where we have our hillside slide um, and, and some other sitting places. Uh, there's a little bit of stone to help us uh, retain some of the grade and, and create some of the, the interest in that area. 
um, maybe flanking this slide on either side, um, thinking about a, a hill climb. So those little kind of colored shapes, if you've seen those hand holds and toe holds that they use for climbing, maybe we do something like that to give the kids a way to get right back up on that hillside. Um, the idea of using some of the other stones and things like that. Um, uh, again, this inspiration from our own location uh, with the stone um, talus slopes, if you're familiar with that, that's just where the rocks tumble. So we started thinking about um, this idea of, we mentioned a lot, caves, tunnels. And, and we kind of, we struggled with it a little bit because anytime you create like a, a tunnel or a cave, you've got a wonderful play opportunity, but you also have a great spot for someone to spend the night that you don't really care to have in your play area. So, we, we kind of thought, well, what if we worked out of work with this natural materials a little bit more? And so, in a, in a banks like this, there's large gray shape that you see that could actually be a, a cave that we could make using stones. Of course, we have to engineer it and do it in the right ways. But the idea of being able to create a spot like that a little bit, talk a lot about the, like at Woodland Park Zoo, if you're familiar with the little cubbies that they put off the side of the North Trails. Um, area so every kid likes to kind of crawl in there so it's not very deep it's not very big but but something like that and then this idea of tunnels well, what can we do with a tunnel that we can actually be able to you know, kids can actually go through so the same idea that we took the, this this idea of stone and, and stacking them and this will kind of be explored but we can actually pull this off structurally but having a, a flat stone bridging between two flat stones so you have a space underneath it um, there are manufactured products like this, you know. I, I sheepishly say that because we like to stay natural, but if we wanted to feature bad enough, we might go to that if we can't uh, solve the structural issues with, with doing something like that. Um, but the whole idea of, of a space like this, um, uh, you know, we call it loose parts. Maybe there's things in there that the kids get to move around, whether it's stones, um, the, the concept of branches, you know, just the fact of poles. The story I love that was shared was, uh, family was on a, on a hike and they stopped along the way to rest. Kids don't rest, of course, so they started going around gathering sticks. And by the time I got, got done, they had kind of created a little shelter or something out of sticks they were just finding on the forest floor. And thought, well, why couldn't we do something like that here? Of course, that takes some effort to keep the sticks uh, supply uh, replenished and things, but the idea of having, um, again, what we call loose parts, so that ability to be able to have, um, have something incorporated. Into our space there. Um, it kind of transitions through the trees uh, into this area, and then of course we've got our again our mound area. The idea of being it's sort of helping us close off the edges here, the, the whole uh, Nima, Nima mound idea. Um, the pathways a little different on this one. So our, our bike loop, our, our kind of primary loop, is, is uh, circulating out here around the sort of the grand lawn space, um, and then we have the secondary path, kind of the adventure path, and again. This path would be something that we could um, cast stones in, we could play with the textures, uh, we can put other materials, we can do leaf impressions. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities, things that we could do with this, um, this little path to kind of give it its own uh, sense of creativity and, and, and life. So, um, something that we're going to still explore a little bit. Uh, there is a feature on the path on this one that's a little bit different. We call that the tunnel. What, what we'd like to do. Um, and one of the things that, that uh, we're inspired by is we want to make sure that all the play is accessible. Because in the kids' club, we did have a, a young lady there that was in a wheelchair. We really wanted to think about what, what can she experience. And of course, these tunnels and bridges would be a little bit harder, but we thought if we put some sort of framework on the pathway, and if you imagine these are uh, possibly kid-sized groups, but could be adult-sized, if we all felt like we needed to go through them, we show five of them, but they'd be loose if you go through and get the sense of passing through a tunnel. But we also think this one of these things for the kids is that if you were to bring out blankets or tarps or other things, you could actually cover them and create that kind of play space. Again, the idea of letting the kids um, take some framework that, that we provide and let them run with it. Um, you could tie ribbons on these and kind of act like you're going through the forest, uh, all kinds of opportunities. But just this idea that something on our, our Hard surface circulated path that um, that all park users and visitors could, could take advantage of. So, and again, I'll say you know any structures or anything we put out here for build play, those are going to be accessible also. But we just wanted to enhance it just a little bit more. Um, so we scaled back on the swings. 
um, kind of a zip line swing trade off. So, something for you to think about. So, we do show a couple days of swings in here um, the 5 to 12 year old structure in this area and the pot structure in this area, a little bit closer to the kind of the plaza and gathering space. Um, on most schemes, either plaza, uh, depending on the kind of shelter, we, we could accommodate that depending on how the fundraising goes. So, um, just to let you know, these are fluid enough that uh, we can accommodate those. Um, we show some modest changes around the restroom, uh, kind of creating some access points to the restroom. And these are actually the fill of the in there. Uh, is that where we want to spend some money? We don't have to spend play money on that. We would need use some of our other budget to do that too, but the idea would we want to try to enhance that so you kind of look at that as a contrast between the two students. Um, so around the loop path, uh, before I go to the children's garden, just kind of a, a unique thing that we thought from the entrance, uh, the crosswalk actually lines up here. And so what we did is split this, and what the idea is that if, if anybody, any kids were headed that way, the idea is to slow them down. We created the kids' path, the kids' size entrance on this side, and the adult entrance on this side. Not that you can use either one, but you know, the idea <laughs> that we scale it for the kids. But we split them so that you don't just have that straight shot out into the, into the crosswalk. And the other student is actually a straight shot. So look at that as, a, as an option in the contrast. Um, so the kids' garden. So again, it's the Northwest, and, and we're, we're kind of inspired by where we live. And so the idea of these pattern of actually being raindrops. And so the older raindrop has the bigger rain, but it slowly relates to the erased by the smaller rains and the newer raindrops. So this is the existing pergola at the center. And we create kind of a paved space. It's, it's kind of an inwardly focused space right now. You sit on the benches the way they are and, and face each other. But we thought that the garden wants to expand out from there. So we added a ring around that so you could actually sit on those benches either way and face either way and be able to enjoy that space. Again, the idea of the garden space with all these, um, what do we call them, instant action? What was the quick, quick uh, change to sunflower, green poles, that type of thing um, in this space? And then this side becomes our, uh, again, our, uh, our experience space, our kind of, uh, get dirty space. And so some of the opportunities to participate in that. Um, kind of flanking this and sweeping out, and you kind of see the, the kind of gold and grassy of the Palouse. So we're kind of drawing a little bit more Eastern Washington into this, and um, the idea of, of, of how that could help frame this whole space. The hedge is here, but you'll notice that the, the opening is closed off and the stair is gone. But we put an option to sweep the path down around. Um, kind of that idea that if people are moving through the park, that they could enter here and just move on past, kind of private, not kind of privatizing, but kind of taking the, the children's areas off the main route of travel. So people can, can pass by, but they don't have to go right through the middle of it. So that's an option to consider um, if you notice that, that's a little bit of a change there. So. Um, in both schemes, and I, I probably didn't mention this at all, but we have kind of shown ideas of how we can tie these discovery elements throughout the butterflies and, and the features that way. So again, look at kind of those ideas and some of the other layers of details and things that we'll get to. So a lot of great input um, on the different options and what the preferences are. And um, I guess I'll just go through them. You guys feel free to chime in, let me know if I miss anything. But um, in our group, the zip line was preferred over the two swings, um, but they also wanted to make sure that they we include swings that have uh, swings for all ages because right now there's kind of a little kids and a big kids swing. So if we could do that within maybe one bay of swings, um, that would be great. Uh, love the climbing wall option with the slide. And again, we were talking about how it's not necessarily going to be a very vertical wall. It'll follow the grade of the slide. So it would be something that littler kids could use too. Um, for the play equipment, they liked uh, sort of the modern look with more muted colors, more natural colors, but not so much the big wood structures, more for visibility. Um, and just hard time seeing through some of those things. Um, let's see. They love the hillside slide, but wanted a double shoot so that two kids could go down at once. And um, 
the wood, they thought the natural materials kind of just, they get wet and they kind of stay wet and um, didn't like the idea of having wood chips and then a wood structure too, it's just too much wood. So maybe that would be a good contrast is to have some of the other play equipment with more natural looking colors, but um, not wood. Um, one of the little girls in the, in the group really likes the small play items like we saw in here, um, just because there's more room to run and jump and do things around them. Um, and um, there was a couple of things that we didn't have that was mentioned at the last meeting, and it's great that we did this because that's why we're doing this. Um, but talk about the merry-go-round and you know the existing merry-go-round, and maybe we can't use that again but maybe we, we could still have something that kind of spins and does that. Um, and then also doing some spinner bowls. That was mentioned at the last meeting. So doing some of those. Um, in the children's garden, one comment was that this intersecting path in here might create some conflict just with the traffic of the overall park. So they, they like the um, aesthetic of this, but maybe having more of a separation that's shown like in this one. Um, and then they also like just the, the textures and things like that going through um, your trike or your bike with the different textures. Um, there was a lot of talk about the access um, through the park and at first this was kind of the preferred option coming through this way but then after some conversation and I think this is still kind of 50-50 a little bit and you guys chimed in about it but um, they liked having this going through just because it did kind of bring people through that area and there would be more visibility and more awareness of going through the area and this way maybe it's a little more private and not used as much. Um, quote me if I'm, I'm, let me know if I'm not stating that correctly. But maybe we could have a little cut through path here and still have this as well um, as a different idea or option for that. If it's too convenient, maybe that garden gets trampled. Maybe that space is just used too much in those areas around it. Um, get too much use around them. Um, we did have one little plan of play put together. <laughs> so we have the swing, which I forgot to provide, and then um, all the little play pieces in here, the oodle swing, and then the, the bigger play structure. So pretty much everything you could possibly fit <laughs> in this little spot in here. <laughs> um, there was some talk about the, the a fence, and I don't know how much we really got into this, but we did look at the feasibility of replacing the fence, and just through our budget and everything, we decided that our priorities were elsewhere. But if things shake out and we do have money, maybe we could replace some of the mesh. The existing art poles will will stay in place, but right now, from what I understand, it's a 10-foot fence, so maybe looking at doing something a little bit lower would be an option. Um, the split pathway in here, seems um, like maybe this is too far apart. We have 20 feet in between and the concern about going to the crosswalk and having your kid run across the street without having the adult right next to them, um, helping them across the street. Um, Katie, so the, the idea is good, it's just too wide or just do a straight shot to the sidewalk? I think it's just too wide. Too okay. wide. Okay. Too wide. Uh, love the tunnels with the rings. Um, as far as the lawn area, like the smaller lawn area with more play, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Anything else? Wall. That sounds good. Oh yes, that's right. Uh, the wall. Um, right now, I guess this is kind of used as a ball wall, and you know what SPU decides to do with this building in the future is not really um, under our control at the moment or really known, but. Um, but right now it's kind of used as a ball wall, so if there was a lawn or a palouse grass area enclosed right here, that maybe that wouldn't be used as that anymore, so that's just a consideration to think about, and maybe this this little piece isn't incorporated into that. Is that it? Thank you, everyone. Failure. So, um, some of the things that we had, I mean, I could work off of that list for the most part. Zip line, got a, got a big thumbs up. Yes, yeah, so let's do a zip line. But our debate was zip line versus swings, and this idea that um, let's let's do the zip line, but let's try to keep as many swings as we can. So that's our challenge: is to kind of see how we can meld this together. So it wasn't 
Every, not everybody is willing to give up either one. So we're going to work on that one and see what we can come up with. So this kind of zip line and, and swings work in there. Um, so just kind of going down this list, uh, lots of climbing activities, overhead activities for the older kids. So when we're thinking about the kind of structure we're using, think about those kinds of play events on it. Um, making sure that we have um, uh, you know, slides for the small kids are okay, um, but don't overdo it with slides for the big kids. Do other activities for them so that we have uh, a variety of things. Um, structures that have lots of platforms and climbing opportunities. So um, the point was this one has lots of climbing opportunities, but there's no platforms, no places to hang out, whereas these kind of, this, this kind of, so we look at those. Um, the idea of using something something simple, um, example was given of, we called it wood pilings or stumps. Um, it plays off this, this uh, toadstool idea, but the idea of, of having just these, these natural elements that could define the edge of one of our paths or some of our transition spaces, but just these opportunities for the kids to kind of create the play from them. Um, we got a request for a trampoline or bridge type idea, and so we kind of thought that there is, a, there is a piece of equipment that is kind of a ground-mounted platform. We even thought a bridge that has that kind of springiness to it might achieve that, so we kind of, kind of work off of that detail. Um, you know, thinking about our structures, high, let's, let's think six or seven feet for a platform in the, in the five to 12 year age, uh, age range area, so something that's uh, a little bit bigger. Um, a loop path. So there was a preference for uh, maybe option two um, over one, but the, the loop path being long on option one. So the idea is it's still there, it's not as continuous, so maybe working a little bit of that continuous loop into option two. Um, oh, and then, but don't forget the textured surfaces, that when we've got all these fun surfaces to go across, make sure we incorporate them into a, a long loop path. So. Uh, dry stream was recalled that that was something we talked a little bit about from the last one. We even talked about real water again, um, collecting the storm water type things. Um, we don't have a lot of collection area right in this part of the park, but the idea of having a dry stream um, concept, maybe even kind of what's starting to be shown in this, this scheme, so kind of using those natural features that way. Um, the, the next two kind of go together, but just this idea of creating just a geocache niche somewhere in here, and that's you know, easy in the rock somewhere, or somehow we can incorporate that. But it went a little bit further to more the, the whole park and this idea of having, um, I call them survey points, but the idea of being able to locate yourself using a found marker in the park. And we even said, what about those markers at the four corners of the reservoir, having some sort of a monument at those so that somebody could actually orient themselves by, by using those. So, um, we already talked about maximum swings. Uh, this got a star because of the idea of maybe some of the natural material with it and even this feature where it's kind of like climbing a tree with the pole with the rungs on it uh, was preferred. But there was this, this desire to kind of take um, this, this natural play, but don't forget about these climbing nets. So kind of taking that, and I think this is a little bit of what we heard from your group was um, some of the wood and natural play combined with some of the more contemporary kind of play see how those come together. So we can do a little bit of search for play structures that would do that. Um, the, there was a preference for the bypass. So leaving the, the garden space as, as a destination rather than a pass through at the pergola, but incorporating that path in there. And definitely we got the same um, ball wall comment with the existing structure there. So uh, no need to stretch the Palouse all the way to Western Washington. So we can, <laughs> we can limit that a little bit. So. Um, so any of the marks I have on there? What do you think? Anything else that uh, we can think of? Or? Okay, there we go. Summary for two. And the ball fields. And right now, to a certain extent, it's the past through the pergola. Although there's an option to go the other way around, but as long as that's considered and made obvious. Mm -hmm. Is um everybody knows that there's no signage or anything, right? Everybody just knows to go up that wood stair as an option. Is it is it signage or what's some small gesture that way or 
Just everybody knows. Well, the standard, I mean, the obvious way is that, that stairs. There, there is, you cut directly through it because there is a break in the hedge. Yeah, but there's no path shown there, so there's no obvious way. I mean, if you know, you, you can, you know, you, and if you're that sort of a you can get there. I did notice the dugouts from the one field are much further away. The orientation of the batting area, and so the, the dugouts are, it seems like one ballpark has the dugouts closer to the restroom, and then the other ballpark, since they have the outfields against each other, the, the other dugouts are, and, and I don't know if you plan on moving dugouts or anything like that. Or wherever the teams are coming out. I mean, it seemed like one of them had the... Uh, yeah, the batting area. Yeah, right? it's, it's yeah. considerably farther Home away. Way yeah. Yeah. So the one on the right, it seems like it's much. So well, I guess you can't fix that. No, it's 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 not as I remember it. Yeah. It's about as close as you can get. And we're using the fields in, in about the in the configuration they are just to kind of yeah. minimize yeah. the amount. No, of No, I was thinking they were. Over it was over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I might have missed this earlier, but what what is the current thought or plan for kind of connecting? the family terrace area to the reservoir. Is there a staircase or what, what is kind of the thinking on that? If, if uh, the community has their way, there's a staircase. So there's, there's a, a desire to make a connection in this area because we have the one in here. Um, the reason I made a comment about the existing stair being there is that they haven't torn it out. We were told it's going to get torn out in order to put pipes in there. It's still there today. <coughs> They've torn up everything else. Maybe it's going to stay, and I, you know, maybe it's a good call to Stephanie Murphy to ask, can we keep that stair? If we can keep that one, we have to put handrails on it to make it compliant with code, but then we, we could take the budget here easily and think about a connection in this area. So that's kind of where we are, is, is, is the, how far we are stretching the dollars to where we can get them there. So that'd be... And we've been hearing that, that question and comment over and over, and we recognize that once the family terrace is renovated, it's this great place, and the upper terrace is available, there's going to be a lot of traffic back and forth, and uh, that's really important. So we'll be looking at that. It's kind of outside of the scope of what you know, we're talking about family terrace wise today, but we recognize that connection is important. So that connection will probably come from the $5 million instead of the $450,000, correct? Yeah. So to clarify your comment, if it was if the existing staircase was taken out, we would have to use funds to rebuild a new staircase. Yeah. And if it stays, we would save some money that potentially could go towards the subject. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, a stair that's there existing, it's in it's in great shape, and nobody's walked on it for sixty years or something. So <laughs> yeah. it just needs yeah. 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 For the most part, I hope it's not got other flaws that we don't see. But uh, yeah. uh, I think both groups are probably focused on. Themes that keeps getting brought up over the years has been the main belief identity, right? So we didn't, neither, neither group mentioned it specifically, but these include the main belief the photo that stamps in the concrete or other pieces of artwork. I think that, that goes a long way towards um, giving a sense of identity. Yeah. A lot of the roundabouts in the neighborhood have the main beliefs stamped in the concrete. <coughs> What, what we actually like to do, probably didn't really mention this, is, is um, out in the play area, uh, anywhere the curb for the play area intersects, there's a, basically a triangle with the main belief right. in it. A little bit of investigation, you might be able to get those triangles away without destroying them, and then reset those in some way. And I don't know whether that would be, um, right now, whether it be uh, in, in a hard surface we use them, um, or do we put them you know, as a discovery element, or we use them in the garden as yeah. step stones. But yeah, that's what I'm talking. Yeah, so we could we could potentially, and I, you know, what I love about it is reusing something, so we oh, salvage something, saving money, saving yeah. energy, <laughs> all that good stuff. So, yeah. Go ahead. We'll go. I have uh, one thing about the fence. I don't know what the whole brouhaha is about it, but. From my opinion, having the existing fence along Roosevelt with its existing height is perfectly fine because it really, you don't notice it. It's, 
you just look right through it. I think if you lowered it to six feet or whatever, then you have this line right around your head, and I think you'd be more conscious of it. And from my son's point of view, he'd be more likely to try to climb over it <laughs> as a six-foot fence. Right now, he's not looking at it. Yeah. Well, because so. for, for kind of, you know, with us coming to the neighborhood fresh eyes and we see it, we see these 10-foot fences and it's, whoa, do we really need these 10-foot fences? What should we do? And so this idea, what we wanted to do was actually do a, a more interesting edge, you know, with the play area. And then as we kind of got in the budget, we said, the kids don't care about an interesting edge. That's us. So <laughs> let's leave the 10-foot fence yeah. if we have to. If, if possible, it could become a 4-foot, but we definitely aren't so. But, but, but if there's a, 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 you know, if you're comfortable with the 10 foot being there, then maybe we just leave that on, leave it off the table. And, so. I just wanted to make sure I put my vote on the other side. I live across the street and I look at it. I look across, I like to see trees and, and the, I even like to see the structure of the, the, the restrooms. It's a decent building. What I see is the fence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the artwork that's incorporating the fence does very little to enhance it. And I think, I'm inclined to think the purpose of a 10 foot fence wasn't so much keeping children from climbing out, as from keeping balls and things from going into Roosevelt. And I think with the new design and the accessibility of the main field up on top, that's going to be less necessary. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess I, I'd never heard an opinion why the why there's a ten foot fence. Well, right now there's a lot of ball use in that field, mm -hmm. as in and people are playing frisbee there, and I think all most of that activity is going to move up to the top, yeah. to the bigger space, yeah. especially if you fill it in with a lot of this other stuff. That's a good point. Yeah, did you have a question? Well, I have two comments. If the if the fence does go away, would they still leave the pillars of art or move yeah. the art? Because I yeah. like I think somebody said that they thought that art was terrible, and you know I think it's kind of cool myself. I liked it. Yeah. No. The the idea would the, they would come and take the panels away if we modified the fence, and then they'd bring them back. So yeah. And my other comment is the last thing I said over there was. Um, uh, and this has to do with the whole park, not just the kids' park. I'd like, I want to see some large signs that says, this is not an off-leash dog park. <laughs> and maybe saying, this park does have it, or these parks do have it, or something. Kim, is that standard language? And um, standard, one of our standard signs is by players and ball fields not to have dogs off leash or just dogs in general because dogs simply aren't allowed in play areas or on ball fields. So there's, there's an ordinance that states that so a community member could actually you know, call the police and have them come and issue a ticket. And that, that does happen in yeah. certain parts. They, community members get fed up. There's no signs now, so I'd like to see some so, put in. So that's something that, yeah. that we can consider putting in one of those yeah. signs if the ordinance number Any other comments? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. This is extremely helpful. Yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.